Today starts a new series about how to teach music using BandLab. Hi guys, I'm Anthony and this is EdTech Music where we look at how technology can help teachers deliver music with more engagement and fun. Today we're going to start a new series on BandLab, which is a web-based tool for editing, controlling, recording and arranging sounds. Okay, so let's jump right in. Here I am at bandlab.com, the BandLab website. And before we go any further, the first question is why invest time in BandLab? Well, first of all, it's web-based, which means if you're working on a Mac, a PC, or a Chromebook, or pretty much anything else, you and your students will be able to access and use BandLab. There are also apps for mobile phones and tablets as well. Now you can edit your own sounds and ready-made loops that are built into it, as well as record and mix all of those things together. You can also record instruments in and and manipulate MIDI if you want to later as well. Now if you grow out of BandLab ever, then there's a desktop program, Cakewalk by BandLab, which is an extension of the features in BandLab, but allows you the power of having a desktop program. And so that's available as well. And then the final question is around the investment. And when you go to their website and discuss, is it really free? Then they say, absolutely, it is free, including use of all the sounds which are licensed under a Creative Commons license, which means you can use them for anything afterwards. There are two versions of BandLab, bandlab.com and the education site, edu.bandlab.com. So this is the one that we're going to be registering using just to get used to the features in the education version slightly easier. So the first thing I'm going to do is click on Start as a Teacher. And from there, I'm going to register. Having now registered, I'm going to get an email that wants me to click on a link to confirm it's my email address. I can do that a bit later, but you need to do it at some point. And here we are in the education version of BandLab interface. So here it's giving me the option to tell me about the class or school I'm part of already. A space where I can create a school and then join or create classes within that school. But initially, we're going to focus on the tools in the top right corner. These aren't going to change, they're going to stay there. If I click on the top right, it takes me to my profile and shortcuts to some of those other links. Then the chat window here will open once I've confirmed my email address. I have notifications that will come up as I interact with my students. And then this library area, which when I click on, takes me to a new screen. First thing I'm going to do is create a project. And here I am in BandLab. BandLab is a DAW, or D-A-W standing for Digital Audio Workstation, which as we said means I can work with computer generated sounds or recordings of real sounds or real instruments or voice and any mix of those things together. It's hugely powerful and the sort of facility that wasn't available in the browser until fairly recently. Here BandLab is going to give me some choices of where I want to start. Well actually I'm not going to choose any of these new track choices to start with. I'm going to go down to the two here, one saying import audio or MIDI, but I'm interested in this one, browse loops. Loops are the library of pre-recorded sounds that BandLab has chosen to work together. Let me click on that and straight away it's given me more of a view of the interface so that we can have a little look round. Right, some things I'm used to seeing from other tools like this. So I've got this dark space down the side where my tracks are going to appear. I've got this timeline view in the middle. You can see it going up at the moment in bars. And then a space here where all of the different loops and sounds and recordings that I'm working with will appear. The top area is dedicated to the transport control with the usual controls that I'm used to seeing in other things. Go to the beginning, play, go to the end, record, the counter, information about the key and the tempo or beats per minute, BPM, the time signature, I can turn on or off the metronome and then I have an internal volume control within the app rather than using my computer sound volume. Another button that's going to be very important to learn is the save button in the top right corner here. Notice it's telling me when I last saved and that will change as my projects progress. 
So today's job is to get to know the band lab interface. Now, even as a teacher, you're gonna have a lot of fun with this. And that's great because the more you enjoy it, the more you're likely to play with it and try out and experiment. And that's gonna make you more confident in the classroom later. So let's get stuck in. Now, over here down this side, we've got this area which has all of the different loop packs that are currently available. I'm gonna scroll down and just choose this Lo-Fi Hip Hop Volume 2 as an example. And when I go to it, you can see it's taken me into this nested menu. And here are all the sounds in here. Now I can scroll up and down and choose between them, or I can click on instruments and filter them by that, or click on genre and filter them like that. Okay, so to start with, I'm going to go into instruments and I'm gonna change it to drums. Now it's just showing me the drum sounds. Now, if I click on this play button here, it's gonna preview the sound. And I'm happy with that one, so I'm going to double click it. And you can see double clicking the sound puts its loop over here at the beginning of the track. Actually, it's lined it up with where the playhead, this tool is at the time, which was happened to be right at the beginning. You can see as well as adding it to a row of its own there, it's given it an information area next to the track. Here I've got options to change the volume level of this track and also the pan where it is in the left or right sound. I've got options to solo that track and mute that track. And also the name has come up automatically based on this track, this loops. And also the name has come up automatically based on the loop name here, but I can double click on it and change it manually if I want to. We'll explore other options later. So when I double clicked, that loop was added where the playhead was. Let me undo that for a minute. And this time, rather than double clicking on the sound, I'm gonna grab it with the mouse button down and drag it over to where I want it to be. There we go, now it's in. You can see the effect is the same, but this way I get to choose where I want it to be. Let me rewind with the play control and then hit play. That's great. And you can see straight away that the loop that I've chosen, we can see the wavetable graphic representing that sound in the background of that block. Now something I can do to get used to seeing how sounds work together is to turn on the loop control. If I go up to the number line here representing the bar numbers and click in this space you can see it's turned a dark red and if I go to the end here where it finishes I can drag it back to here and now when I play it's going to loop the section that is in dark red. There we go, so that's a useful tool. Let's rewind it and let's add in some other sounds. So we're going back to the loops library and I'm gonna change drum for keyboard. And let's grab that sound. And you can see now that I've added it to a new row of its own, again, the information is duplicated there, just like the drum track was above. Let's hear these two together. Something just to focus on quickly is that when we line up that playhead by the one, you can see both of these tracks line up right by it. So if they happen to accidentally not be joined to the beginning of the bar, we need to move them up there we go, and you can feel them clicking on like there's a magnet joined to it. In fact, that's the mode it's on by default so that these tracks automatically line up. And it means that they finish at the end of that second bar ready for the new beat of bar three as well. And that kind of mathematical accuracy with sequencing makes a big difference to the quality of the sound. Let's move on with some other sounds. So I'll change keyboard this time and I'm going to go to bass. Here we go, and once I put it down, I need to pick it up and match it. And you can see as I'm moving it, the line vertically showing me where I am relative to the bar number or the beat of the bar. Let's drag it over, there we go. And now still with this loop tool turned on, let's play. So I don't particularly hear that, so I'm gonna turn down the keys a little bit. That's a bit 
better. So, so far, I have a drum track, I have a keyboard track, and a low sound, a bass sound. Now, let's move on to something different. So, let's add in a guitar track. Let's drag that in, and let's hear what that sounds like. Something you might have noticed is that all of these sounds work together automatically. And that's because, because they're in a pack together, they automatically are at the same tempo and in the same key as well. So when you're working with the pre-installed loops within BandLab, you don't need to worry about the key. And that's great for students because it's one less thing to worry about as they're learning to arrange sound. Now I'm going to grab another instrument and we're going to go for some brass. OK, let's take this sound across and then drag it back to the beginning. Let's just hear all of these things together. OK, so I've used this looping tool at the top that I can click to turn off or on. What I'm going to do now is turn that off and start to organise these sounds as a piece of music. When I click on the sound, I want more of this sound. So what I'm going to do is go to the end of the sound and at the top here you can see there's that looping icon. When I hover above that part of here, it changes to a double-ended arrow. That doesn't happen down the bottom, only at the top. And when I do that, it means I can grab that and pull that sound outwards and you can see that it's looping that first two bars over and over. Let's go all the way to there to 15 and I'm going to do the same thing with each of these tracks so that I have a brick wall effect. Now the brick wall is something that I'm sure you've already come across before that children initially want to paint the entire sound stage so that everything is covered. And when we do this, it's the same as looping that first two bars, isn't it? It's not, there's no change, there's no sub variety, there's no um, build or fade in energy, which really is what we're looking for throughout the piece of music. We want some variety and to tell a story. And the, the story that we often tell is a gradual building of sounds, and then at the end, a gradual relinquishing of sounds. And in that way, it makes a more interesting piece. So there's a couple of ways we can do this. First of all, we're going to up explore the upside down pyramid, which is what I call it with children, which gets them used to the idea of how to help the listener to interpret the sounds. So the easiest way to start with, um, there's two ways I can do this. I'm going to build a pyramid upside down. Now, like at the end of the track, you can see there's that loop out button. At the beginning of the track, at the bottom, is this button here, but what I'm doing there, when I pull that in, you can see it's not really doing what I want in terms of dragging that track along. It's actually changing how much of the track is looped. So I can't do that. What I'm going to do is click on the track anywhere and drag it. And I'm going to drag it to there so that it's two bars in. Now I'm going to grab the next track and drag it another two bars in. And the next track and drag that two bars in and then the next track and drag that two bars in. There we go. So now I've got a gradual start to my piece of music. Let's play that. And in this way we can talk to children about interpreting what they can see. Does it sound like what you expect it to sound like looking at the wavetable of each instrument? OK, so we've gradually introduced our sounds and it means that the listener can understand what they're hearing because they've been introduced to them gradually and seen it build the layer. So with children, I always talk about this being like cake. Um, any food analogy works well in my mind. And they get used to those layers of sound gradually building up. Now here you can see I'm doing the same thing in reverse now. I'm gradually reducing the sounds so that now we have the upside down pyramid. Now I want to zoom out slightly but I can't see the controls at the moment and that's because this loops area actually is covering them. So down in the bottom corner here I've got buttons to toggle on and off lyrics or notes, 
loops and MIDI mapping. Well, I'm just going to click on the one that's highlighted loops and you can see that it disappears. And now that it's disappeared, in the top right corner, I can see plus and minus. So let me just click minus to zoom out slightly. And now we can see the whole of this initial composition. Let me go and play it from the beginning. And we'll just want to consider how it introduces learners for the first time to adding sounds and removing sounds as a way to gradually build and then reduce the energy of the piece. OK, so although it's not the most exciting composition, the takeaways from this are that in the initial stages of teaching children to sequence or to arrange their sounds, what we want to do is give them the idea of gradually introducing and then gradually taking out sounds to get used to hearing the different sounds together. OK, let's go to this week's Teacher Read. So today we're carrying on with Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport. We started this book last week and considered the idea of solitude deprivation, how important time on your own is in formulating your ideas and making sense of the world. Well, today we're carrying on looking at a new principle, digital distraction. Um, and this is very much based on the idea we introduced last week about the idea that your time is very much their money. And this is where the principle of digital minimalism comes from. It's a philosophy of technology use in which you focus your online time on a small number of carefully selected and optimised activities that strongly support things you value and then happily miss out on everything else. So when we're thinking about that, Cal raises the point that simply put, humans are not wired to be constantly wired. Um, this is a great quote from the book. And it says at the bottom, because let's face it, checking your likes is the new smoking. And that is the idea that technology is carefully engineered to maintain your attention. And that is what is being sold. And with that in mind, um, there's two key points I want to pull you out to today. How tech companies encourage behavioural addiction, intermittent positive reinforcement and the drive for social approval. Those two things that I know we talk to learners a lot about in school these days around that you don't get notifications when they happen to be prompted by someone at the other end, you get notifications on a carefully pre-approved time schedule since the last notification you had. I coupled that with the second part of this, the reinforcement and the drive for social approval to be on call for your friends, to be available whenever they post, is a powerful, powerful thing. Um, as it says, in many cases, these addictive properties of new technologies are not accidents, but instead carefully engineered design features. So that's today's chunk that we're putting on top of everything we looked at last week about solitude deprivation and the importance of time on our own. Now thinking about that actually you might really want to read this book because it's got a lot of good things to say about online safety and healthy habits and safe behaviours for young people. So again, I've linked the book in the description and if it interests you, take a look. So I'm going to follow this video up with the next in the series on BandLab and I'll link on the screen here once that's available. That video will focus on how to set up your first school and class in BandLab and how to apply what we've learned today to put into practice as an assignment for students. Well, if you've got value out of today's video, please hit the like button to help others find it. Consider subscribing so that you get notified when other videos are available and see you again.